Okay, so it's gotten better, right? So it used to be that the peak was about 1972. There was about, um, there was something like 54,000 deaths, right? Another way of looking at these numbers are, these numbers are comparable to what Americans lost in, in the Vietnam War, the Korean War, right? And these last a long time, but we're looking at sort of every year. So wh why did, how's, and, and this is total numbers. Remember what's happened, the population's grown significantly since the 70s, right? So what's happened in the meantime? Why has it gotten better? Why, why have we had fewer traffic fatalities? I mean, significantly fewer. Safer cars. It's most likely technology. And probably the huge thing is seatbelts, right? Seatbelts is exact. People started, we had them before then, but people started wearing them. But there's also anti-lock brakes. There's, um, there's um, stability control for the vehicles. There's airbags, which are huge, right? So technology has gotten better. Now, here's the, here's, the, here's the bad news, right? The bad news is that it's actually, the number of fatalities has been creeping up significantly for the last few years. So what's that about? Distractions, probably cell phones. Almost certainly, it's almost certainly cell phones, right? Um, and it's 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 really bad. Apparently, something like 20, 26 percent of the people involved in crashes admit to using their cell phone, okay, while they were driving. Okay, admit, you know, those are the people that are admitting it. Imagine what's really going on, right? So, unfortunately, that's bad. The leading cause of death for people three to 33 years old, right? So before that, there's infinite mortality and such, and after that, there's you know, disease and such. But from three to 33, the leading cause of death is, is motor vehicle accident, you know, pedestrian, bicycle, including all of those things. Okay, so how many, per, what percentage of traffic fatalities in the U.S., or traffic accidents, get it right here, um, are due to motorist error, human error? What do you think? Ballpark. 30%? No, higher. Higher. Keep going. 70, keep going. No, wow. Did you, did you see my notes? <laughs> 93, that's what I got too, right? Um, <laughs> give that man a prize, right? Give him an extra, an extra close on. 93% are due to driver error, human error. Okay, so what are the leading causes of, of traffic accidents? All of them. Falling asleep. So that's um, um, driver fatigue. That's number two on the list. What else? Hmm? Um, drunk driving, number four on the list. Okay, we'll, we'll put that in distracted driving in the category. That's number one. Number one, distracted driving more generally. Um, what are we missing here? Weather. Weather is number six. Okay, speeding. Speeding's number three, and I think we've covered them all. Oh, no, one more, one else, one more is missing. Yeah, distract, distracted driving, okay. Um, falling asleep is number is number two. Maybe we cover that driver fatigue, right? So if you look at that list, right? If if you recap that list, number one, distracted driving, driver fatigue, speeding, drunk driving. Oh, number five is aggressive or reckless driving. Okay, you know, road racing, that sort of thing. Okay, number six is weather. So the top five causes are all human related. Okay, and presumably machines would not be subject to any of those top six. Is going to be a problem. Weather is an issue. It's going to be an issue for for self-driving cars. Okay. So safety is huge, right? It, it's, it's, it's just amazing that, so, so what, I, what I tell my students um, is that when I, when I talk about this, this topic, I say, you know, your children are going to look at you and are going to say, you know, mom, dad, what were you thinking? You were allowing random people to operate one ton machines at up to 70 miles an hour within a few feet of each other. What were you, what did you think was going to happen, right? You know, but we're used to it. We accept it. Okay. We will we probably will not. Um, um, accept it forever because we're going to have another choice. Um, what about people who can't drive, right? What about the blind? What about the disabled? What about the elderly? Children? Teenagers? Teenagers think they can drive. They really can't, okay? Not all. Some are actually quite good. So I, I, I hate to brag, but when my, um, when my stepson got his license, he had a, a perfect driving record for 36 hours. You know, so some of them actually, some of them actually can, can drive quite well. So this allows these people to, to get around, gives them more mobility. Any questions, comments about safety? Safety is just huge. And, and the potential here is enormous, right? You know, the, the standard that these self-driving car companies want to achieve is they want to reduce the number of accidents by a factor of 1,000. That's sort of what they're looking for. Yeah? Oh, I mean, that, that's probably just economics and lobbying and everything else. You know, this stuff is almost certainly going to become mandatory when the technology becomes available. And, and you can see how it's going to happen, right? You know, so seatbelts are mandatory, right? Airbags are mandatory. 
you know, and I think it's just a matter of time as these technologies come along, they're going to become mandatory. You're not going to impose it immediately with a new technology, but you want to make sure it works, right? And, and there's an invested base. But I think it's, it's just time before these things, you know, just become mandatory. And the way it's going to happen is people are going to, are going to, are going to be in these accidents. They're going to sue the company and say, look, why didn't, why didn't your car, why didn't the car you sold me stop? before I ran over that person, right? And, and they're going to have an argument. Look, all these other cars do it, right? And so, well, you didn't purchase that option, right? And so it's going to be cheaper to make it mandatory and include it in the cost than to pay for the lawsuits that go other way. Yeah, Ron. I think it, a little bit it's going a little bit too fast, okay, because I'm, I'm actually a little bit appalled that um, that people, well, I don't know if it's people or the company, but th th some of these things are being marketed like the Tesla and such. You know, they're careful in their, in their boilerplate and stuff to say it's, it's semi-autonomous, but the fact that it's in the car, people are using it and they're, they're, they're falling asleep, they're doing, and you hear these stories all the time, right? And it's not quite ready for that, right? You know, if, if you're on, so I don't have a Tesla, but if I had one, right, what I would, I would trust it on the freeway, okay? I would not trust it in traffic with pedestrians and bicycles and construction and, and traffic lights and, and, you know, cops and all the rest of it, right? I just wouldn't trust it, right? And what's happening, unfortunately, is they probably, you know, in this transition period, they probably need to do more to make sure people are actually engaged in this thing where they, You've got to have your hand on the steering wheel, and they've got to, they actually literally have to, they're going to have to have technology to track the driver to make sure you're actually paying attention because it's not quite there yet. And there's going to be a little bit of a backlash. It's not going to be large, but whenever one of these things is in an accident, it's all over the news, right? You know, the, the other 99 accidents that day, okay, don't make the news because it's not newsworthy. But if it was a self driving car, okay, then it is, it is newsworthy. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so are, are the vehicles on the road getting younger now? So they're, they're lasting longer, right? Um, and um, so I'm not sure what your question is. I, I, don't, I don't know if the average age of vehicles on the road is increasing or decreasing these days. Well, it, that's going to happen, right? Because you're not, you're not going to require people. You, you're going to still allow people to drive their own cars, right? And, you know, and you're not going to do a lot of retrofitting. It's way too expensive. But uh, uh, over time, they'll, they'll go off the road. And at one point, remember, you know, the, the state was actually paying people to take their old polluters off the road, right? We may do that for, for less safe cars. But people will, will, will start to become knowledgeable about that, right? People, people wouldn't, I mean, I guess it's probably mandatory now, but people, when they buy a car, they make sure they've got lots of airbags. So they understand that, and they realize that's going to be safe, and that's going to help them. So that certainly goes on. Okay, um, anything else about safety? Okay, so what's the next, what else can, what, what's the next biggest thing that we might want to tackle? Hmm? Um, sustainability, so that, I have that on my list, but I want to do one other thing before that. Yeah, traffic, thank you. How many people ran into traffic today, this morning? Pretty much everybody. You know, when we recruit faculty candidates, I always tell them I sing the praises of Los Angeles, how great it is and everything. And then I have to be honest, I said, there's one downside here. It's the traffic, okay? And you don't want to be on the road um, at, at rush hour. So let's think about traffic congestion, okay? So on an LA freeway, the maximum throughput is about 60 miles an hour. So it means if the cars are going 60 miles an hour, you're getting the most use out of the car. In other words, the most cars are being able to use that that road, oddly enough. As, as, it, as it starts to, to jumble up, oddly enough, and you, you realize this, but you don't always think about it. The throughput goes down, so the effectiveness, the efficiency of the road really plummets when when they sort of pile up. So at 60 miles an hour, okay, if you take a photo of a freeway overhead and look at how many of the pixels in that in the within the margins of that highway are occupied by vehicles, it's like six percent, right? So in 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 principle, you think about it, all that extra space is kind of wasted space, right? Now why is that space wasted? Well, it's it's in two places, right? There's the width, right? For the, for, this is not as bad. I, I gave a talk in Toronto once, and the fire alarm went off during the talk, right? And then there was a voice over the PA system saying, "It's a false alarm. Don't evacuate the building." And that voice went on continuously for the entire talk. So this I can live with. Okay, so um, 
a freeway, a, what's mandated, mandated by the Federal Interstate Highway Act from the, from the 50s is that an interstate highway lane is 12 feet wide. Okay, a parking space is only 8 feet wide. So maybe you could, with self-driving cars, right, you could probably get away with maybe 10 foot wide lanes, right? So now think about the 405, right? Um, if you had um, five, um, if you had five 10 foot wide lanes, okay, no, six 10 foot wide, let me get this right. Um, basically, if you, if you shrunk your lanes from, from, from 10 feet wide to 6 feet wide, you could basically add an extra lane to the 405 with paint, right? That's what it would take. It would take paint. You burn off the old rides, put the new ones in. We spent $5 billion on the carpool lane in the 405 a few years ago, right? So just being able to narrow the lanes, right, most of our big wide freeways, you could add another lane just by, just with paint, just with a can of paint, okay? Now, yeah. Oh no! For what happened? Um, what happened is, and this just happens all the time. You add more capacity, and more people just drive because now it's tolerable again. And so it has not. It has not reduced the amount of congestion doing that. Right? You know, more people are using it because there's an extra lane. Okay, but it really doesn't reduce the congestion. Unfortunately, so people look at it. And look, this is not a good investment. Right? It's not going to reduce congestion. Okay. So you can put lanes closer together. The other thing is that if you're if you're going 60 miles an hour, right? The, you know, the two-second rule, right, the stopping distance is like 176 feet. Now, people don't really do that in LA. That's probably why we have a lot of crashes, which makes things worse, okay? Um, but if, if you, I mean, this is the rule. You learned this in driver's ed long, 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 long ago, right? But next time you're on the freeway and you're, and you're actually moving along, count how many seconds it is between cars. It's not two seconds. No, if you do that, there'll be about five cars will cut in front of you. It doesn't happen, right? So it's, it's less safe. So there's all that space, right? So if you had a cell, why do you have all this space? between the car. Well, people take almost a second to react. So if someone slams on the brakes or something, before when you see that, you know, when you see that light and you touch your brakes, an entire second has gone by. And then that's, you know, that, that's half that 176 feet, right? And then there's braking distance and everything else. If you had self-driving cars, right, machines can react in microseconds or even faster, right? So all of a sudden the cars could go a lot closer together. Okay, and all of a sudden your congestion, I mean, the, the, the potential for reducing congestion here is enormous, right? The cars can almost be right on top of each other, right? And this is actually something called platooning, particularly if you allow them to communicate, right? So if the cars are talking to each other, right, then in fact, it's, it's even, they can probably be even closer because they know what the car in front is going to do. So whenever the operator in front does something before it actually gets sensed, you could actually communicate to the cars behind and in front of it. So you could shrink that distance enormously. Now, there's a question of public perception. Would people be happy in a car that's a, you know, going at 70 miles an hour that's a few feet or even a few yards behind the car in front of them? Um, they may not. On the other hand, you know, if, if there's a dedicated lane for platooning, they can make their choice, right? And their car can be, you know, if their car is up to it, right? And they can, they can choose to do that or not. They can sit in traffic or they can go in that lane. So congestion is just, is just a huge, huge issue. Um, Absolutely. So that's the next topic, right, which we get into sustainability, right? So now think about this. If you've got cars right on top of each other, right, it's, you know, if you ever watch bicycle racing, right, it's all about, about drafting, okay, at that speed, right? So if, if you're sitting behind another vehicle, right, and you're close behind it, you use very little gas. The only one's using gas is the one in front, the, the one that, that is really not comfortable having someone right in front of them. So that person's willing to, you know, pay for the gas for the whole platoon of cars, right? So it gives you a huge benefit in terms, and basically the, the, the gas consumption is almost all beating air resistance. And air resistance goes as the square of the velocity. And so the faster you go, the worse your fuel economy goes, and it's non-linear, it's, it's quadratic. Okay, so if you can draft, we have a Prius, um, and, we, you, and it has this nice little inst, inst, um, instantaneous fuel efficiency readout, right? Lots of you have this on your car, right? And you can see it, right? You're, you're driving on the five, right? You go up and, and you get ready to pass a truck. When you come close to that truck, all of a sudden your fuel efficiency goes way up, right? Because you're just drafting the other vehicle. So if you've got these platoons of cars, not only has the congestion gone away, right? All of a sudden now you're, you're using very, very little fuel, right? You know, the reason things like trains are so efficient is they're, they're actually coupled. And, and again, it's still air resistance, but it's all, it's just the lead train, the lead car. And so everything else is free, right? Sim similar is, is, is true for, um, for shipping, why it's cheap. There's not air resistance, water resistance, but it's the same concept, right? The one in front does all the work 
pays for all the fuel, everyone else sort of free rides behind them. So um, in terms of, of fuel economy, um, that would be huge. The other thing is, is that humans are not very efficient drivers, right? Rapid acceleration, waste gas, you see that if you, you know, slam on the accelerator, you see your fuel economy go, psh, you know, all braking basically is wasting energy, right? It's turning mechanical energy, which came from your, your, your fuel, um, into heat, and so that's a, that's a waste. Um, congestion itself wastes an enormous amount of fuel, right? People just sitting in traffic, okay? And this is true of all cars, except for hybrids and electric cars. So hybrid and electric cars are not wasting fuel in, in, generically when they're sitting in traffic because they're turning themselves off. But, you know, your internal combustion cars are just burning. You know, they're idling and they're just burning gas, spewing the environment, right? You know, spewing the carbon, et cetera. Any other questions, issues, comments? Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about hacking. So, right, so, so the communication is a good thing by and large, right? And cars are going to be talking to each other, right? Um, to, you know, for safety and issue and all that. And, and um, that's a good thing. The, the, the hacking thing is probably one of the things that scares me, right? And so, you know, if, if you are Tesla, you want to have the ability to, you know, modify the software of all your cars out in the field like that, right? And, and people come expecting, you know? And sometimes you don't like it, right? Because they, they change your software and all of a sudden you don't get the mileage you had before because they're doing various, they're, they're, they're messing with your car all the time, right? And they want that, right? Because they want to do upgrades, they want to do all this stuff. One of the things that worries me is what happens if a bad actor decides they're just going to take over all the Teslas on the road, okay? All right, I mean, it's amazing, right? What, what could be done and you don't have to be in the vehicle. And so this is one of the, you know, security is a huge issue, okay? It's a huge issue with computers in general, but now when you have computers that are going 70 miles an hour, with people in them, right? And there's pedestrians around and everything else. This is probably one of the things that, that worries me the most. I mean, you know, hacking, you really have to get the security right. Um, and, you know, I think what we're doing for now um, probably is you, you probably want to provide access. And so eventually it's going to change and you have to do more, but I think minimally you, you want access to, to manipulate things like, you know, the, the entertainment system and these cars, you know, sort of not the, the driver critical things. But I worry that an external actor can sort of hack into a car and, you know, then take over the braking, the acceleration, that sort of stuff. And, and you know, people have done these at, at security conference. They've looked at, you know, they've taken over cars and done various things. And I think it's a huge, a huge problem. And I don't know what the, what the solution is. Other questions, comments? Okay. Um, how about parking? Anyone, how many people like parking, looking for parking? Nobody, right? Okay. So what do we do with parking? Okay. So we... For every car in the U.S., there are about, on average, there's about three parking spaces. You got one at home, your garage, for example. Okay, you got one at work because you got to be able to park at work because okay? you have to drive to work. And you have to drive by yourself. It's the American way. Um, and and then you've got one more everywhere else. You know, the mall, the restaurant, every place else. So there's like three parking spots now. Why do we have? Well, we, we know why we have those parking spaces. So what could we do with self-driving cars? Yeah. Right. You have fewer cars. We'll get to that in a second, whether people are even going to own cars or not. But, but let's, let's think about the idea of, of sort of owning cars, right? Think about a parking lot, right? In a parking lot, every space has to be individually accessible, right? Every car's got to be able to drive in and drive out independently. If the cars could drive themselves, you just do stack parking, right? You can stack three or four, and then, you know, if, you need to, if that car needs to get out, the other cars get out of the way. They just kind of move, and then they go back in, right? They can be parked pretty close together, even sideways, because there's no one in there that's got to be able to open the door to get in and out of the car, right? And so you can, you can create a parking lot that's a lot denser, you know, and the person doesn't have to do their parking. You just, you know, you just say, go park yourself, right? Um, the other thing you can do is you can locate parking areas outside, you know, so imagine if you have a self-driving car, it's got, you know, you know and, and you, you go to the restaurant or something, you say, okay, um, um, we're going to be here for a couple hours, you know, go park yourself and then come back when I push the button on my phone and come back, right? So then the car could go off out of town, real estate's cheap, park itself for a while, right, and then come back, right? So that's going to sort of improve on parking um, in, in, in that regard um, as well. Um, the, the, so let's talk about whether you're actually going to own a car, which is this issue, right? So when, 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 if you look at the cost of cars, so there's something in, in the blurb that was an intro to my talk which said that, that um, I think the cost of a cab in Manhattan is like 4 or $5 a mile. Okay, if you look at L.A., the, the rate, I think, is about 265 or something a mile. That's what, you know, the, the mandated route, you know, price for a cab. Uber and Lyft are, are, are less. 
for now, but those are going to go up when they have to start actually making money. So don't get too don't get too excited about that. So let's say um, two and a half um, two and a half dollars a mile. Okay, most of that is the cost. At least sixty percent is the cost of the driver. Of course, there's a person there, right? They've got to you know they got to make a living, right? And that's what they're doing all day. So take that away, and down, now you're down to sort of half that amount. Okay, um, and so a a private car. The estimates of a private car is a private car costs about a dollar twenty per mile, okay, about half the price of, of a cab, right? And so that looks, you know, that's why people own cars, because it's generally cheaper. However, a robot taxi, um, the comment in, in the blurb was 40 cents in New York, but more generally is about 75 cents are the estimates, right? So, so a, a robot taxi would probably cost, to, to use it, about 75 cents, okay, per mile. Now, you look at 75 cents per mile compared to $1.20 per mile to own your own, why bother, right? So people, there's going to be a lot less car ownership going on. People are they're going to do the arithmetic and say, look, I don't need, I don't need to own my own car, right? I'm just going to use a um, a shared car and use a robot, a robot taxi. And yeah, if you like to drive, okay. So so it's a great question. So the, so if you think about what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to go rent a car. So my wife and I like to go out to Death Valley and, and go off-road and, and go to these canyons. And, and, and Uber's not going to do that for you. Even if they'll take you there, they won't be there to pick you up when you're you know, 20 miles up in the saline valleys. So, so that will exist. But more generally, here's what I think is going to happen. It's, it's going to be like there will be places. Now we're, now we're going into the future, right? There will be places where you can go, you can rent a car, or maybe you have your own, and it will be like horseback riding. Okay, you'll be places where you can go. There'll be aficionados, right, where you can actually drive your own car. There'll be clubs and everything else, but you won't be all allowed to do it on public highways. Okay, so you know the horse, the horse-drawn buggy, and the horse hasn't gone away. It's a hobby, right? And there'll be people who are into it, and there'll be the old cars, and, and they'll work on them and all that, and they'll, and they'll love driving. It'll be just like the off-road vehicle areas which we have now. You can you can do it. There'll be there'll be space to do it, right? Hopefully, you won't be tearing up the desert, right? But you know, it'll be in a, in a controlled environment. It will not be a public highway where there's other people that that don't want to contend with with human drivers. Okay. Yeah. I think it's going to be huge social impact. So people say that you know, 100 years ago, when when cars became common in this country, it just sort of remade the fabric of society, right? There's so many things that are that are, that are related to the car, and I think. The same sort of thing is going to go on with self-driving cars. What we're going to find is, and we can't even anticipate what it's going to do, right? But it's going to completely remake. It, I think it's going to. I think I believe that when we really have self-driving cars, and those are the majority of the cars on the road, it's going to have as much an impact on society as the automobile had starting about 100 years ago. And exactly what it's going to be, I don't know, right? It's really hard to predict those things, but I think it's going to be it's going to be enormous in that regard. Okay. Um, if people are sharing cars, we don't need as many of them, right? Okay, so you don't, and then, you know, and, and then these cars now are operating all the time, right? And so we need fewer cars, okay? We need fewer, less highway because we've solved the congestion problem. We don't have to have every time you build a, a new development in downtown Los Angeles, you don't need parking spaces for two cars per apartment, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there's all this space now that can might be able to be reused for, for something else which would be more advantageous. Other questions, comments? Yeah. Sure, I agree. Yeah. Good question. So the, 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 the sad news here is that in spite of all the public transportation that's been built in, in Los Angeles, public transportation ridership is actually going down. 
people are using it less than they were before. My guess would be, and I'm not an expert in this, is that, that what's happened is Uber and Lyft have taken a lot of that and made it a lot cheaper. Okay, so will it become public or not? My, my guess is it really is, I mean, what we mean fundamentally by public transportation is, is where you don't own it yourself. So is a taxi cab public transportation? Yeah, probably in some sense. It's, it's in that area and if you start sharing and you want higher volume. So I would think that there's going to be some merge, you know, some sort of convergence of these self-driving taxis and maybe we will think of them as public. You know, what constitutes public or not? You know, is it subsidized? Maybe, maybe it actually gets subsidized by the government, okay? You know, um, it turns out that, that, you know, the cities that are really, you know, metros, real metros, right, are just a, a tremendous boon, right? Whenever you travel and you go to a city where they've got a metro that goes pretty much everywhere, it's just spectacular, right? It's, it's, it's cheap, you can get anywhere, you can go fast, etc. My wife and I were in Paris for a few days this summer, it's just spectacular. It turns out that every metro in the world, every public transportation system like that, is subsidized by the government. And I'm not talking about the development cost of, of digging the tunnels, I'm talking about just operating it, right? And so, but we may decide that you know, in order for all the public goods that all these robot taxis will may keep them even cheaper by subsidizing them. We do it with, with, with public transportation and maybe we'll decide together as a society that's the thing to do there as well. Okay. Yeah. So, so this sounds like a great idea initially if you're the only one who has a robot, if you're the only one who has a, your own flying car, it'd, it'd be wonderful. What's going to happen, of course, is you're, you're flying, when everyone's got a flying car, you're going to have the same problem you had before. Now, you've got more space because you've got the vertical space, right? But that's, you know, that's, that's, that is yet another thing, right? And it's a complex thing, and now the safety becomes a bigger thing. Motion. And it'll start, the bird will fly, it'll be great, right? So, yeah, I'd, I'd love to have a flying car, right? But, yeah, and so I, I think it's going to come along, right? So the three-dimensional aspect is appealing because now you've got all this extra real estate, right? But if you just look at the air traffic control system in this country where there's a minuscule number of these flying beasts, right, they're, they're experiencing congestion problems at airports and that sort of thing. And, and you know, their concern is that the, the current air traffic control system is not up to snuff to handle that amount of traffic. And now when you add, you know, individual flying cars, it's going to get, it's going to be a real challenge. So an interesting question, I mean, this is a little bit outside the scope in terms of flying, but um, how many people here would fly with, I mean, when you get on an airplane these days, there's really three pilots, right? There, there are the two human pilots and then there's the autopilot. And every one of them individually is capable of managing the aircraft, right? How many people here would fly if there's only one, only two pilots, one human and one computer? If it were cheaper? Right? Probably. How many people would fly if there's only the computer? Big difference, right? Maybe, okay. And so there is an issue of public acceptance in this stuff, right? Those are recent, but it turns out that, you know, I'm not an expert in aviation safety, but it turns out that most air, air, air traffic, air accidents, right, aviation accidents are human error as well. You know, the 737 MAX is a different story. It's a very interesting story. It's not the norm. The norm is human error again, right, that, that humans make mistakes. And um, sure. Doesn't have a human pilot. OK. 
Okay. So I mean, there there isn't a matter of public acceptance. You know, some people some people don't fly. Period, because they can't you know they can't tolerate the loss of control. I think that's all that keeps the long distance trains in in, in business these days. That and massive public subsidy, probably right. And so some people will say, no, I'm I will not get in a car which I'm not driving. Okay, and, and forget the fact that the car is a better driver than they are. And and that's fine. They don't have to. Right. There may be you know now that maybe there'll be one lane. Okay, it'll be it'll be the little dirt road on the side, right, where the humans can drive if they really need to before they're banished entirely from the public highways. Yeah. Other comments. Yes. Good question. Good question. Right. We we already deal with this issue, right? There there are always car accidents, right? And then 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 the lawyers get involved and they say, whose fault is it? Is it the fault of the operator? Is it the fault of the manufacturer, right? It's going to be the same deal, right? You know, we, we, we have lawsuits now about, you know, was this accident caused by runaway acceleration in the Toyota or something? Were these accidents caused by, you know, you know Firestone tires exploding on Ford Explorers and falling out? The same issues are going to apply. And, you know, and the, these little things will be decided by juries. They're going to be complex, right? And, you know, people say, oh, the, the, the human driver, you know, the little, sh the, the, the icon on the, on, you know, the thing that you sign when you buy your Tesla says that you're responsible in control. And that's not really going to fly because, you know, the, the, there's an expectation that these things are designed properly and functioning properly. And if they're used as intended, they're supposed to work in a certain way. And so you're going to have lawsuits, you're going to have discussions about, you know, was this accident the fault of the hardware, or the software, or the car, or was it the human operator, or maybe 50 50. Juries do that all the time. They say it's half this, half that. Maybe, maybe not. So, so weather's hard, right? So driving on snow is hard. Driving in rain is hard. Oddly enough, driving at night is easier than during the day because the illumination is more, is more consistent, right? And you don't have shadows and this sort of thing. Um, but, you know, weather is a challenge for people, too. I mean, I, I experience all the time. You're, you're driving west at the end of the day, and the sun is in your face, and, and you really can't see it. It just really freaks you out, and you want to sort of slam on the brakes, but you, but you know the person behind you is in the same situation, so you kind of take your foot off the gas. So, you know, people are, you know, people are good at some things, and humans are good at some, and machines are good at some things. By and large, I think cars are going to, you know, machines are going to be better at driving than people are, but there are going to be challenging situations where, where people have to, you know, think about what goes on. And, you know, the, the big problem, of course, one of the big problems is you have to sort of smoothly, you know, until it's completely autonomous, you've got, you've got, now you've got a, a, you've got your car in autopilot mode. You're really not paying attention, right? You're doing something else even though you're supposed to be, right? And all of a sudden the car needs you to kind of take over. And it's got to sort of recognize that early enough, alert you, tell you, and now you've got to become situationally aware. And, and that transition is going to be a challenge because once you're you're relying on the machine to do your driving, you're not paying as much attention. And then when you need to take over, it's got to somehow tell you and you've got to sort of figure out, okay, what's going on right now and take over. And you can't do it in a fraction of a second. Yeah. Um, not as much as they would with people, right? So, you know, the, what, what's considered a safe following distance and this sort of thing will be calibrated to what the capabilities of the vehicle are, right? And so we're not going to have them too close together if they can't sort of manage that distance. But, but they're not going to be 176 feet apart at 60 miles an hour in the freeway. They, they don't need that kind of space. It's a question of what do they need to actually operate safely? Good question. So here's what I think would happen to insurance. My guess is what will happen is a self-driving car in the long run ought to be cheaper to insure because the risk of an accident is much lower. And so you may have a lower insurance rate if you've got a self-driving car. Will insurance companies still be in business? Sure, because there's, I mean, there's always going to be risk, right? But the risk will all of a sudden be a lot less. Maybe there won't be as much money in automobile insurance, so they'll you know, go into other areas. I don't think that industry is going to disappear, but the risks are going to go down dramatically, and so the cost of insurance ought to go down, 
you know, commensurately as well. So I don't think it's going to disappear. Yeah. So, so what it's going to do to the economy is a really good question. It's a really hard question. In the short term, it's going to put a bunch of people out of work, right? You know, I, I don't, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want my kids to grow up to be truck drivers at this point. It's probably not a good, you know. So in the short term, there's going to be a lot of displacement, particularly driving, right? But it's also going to create opportunities as well. And it's what the overall effect of the economy of this technology is. Um, maybe I'm an optimist. I guess it's probably going to be positive, okay? Um, but it's hard to say. And, and certainly in the short term, any sort of disruptive technology is going to have a negative impact, certainly on certain jobs. Yeah. Which is not counted in the economy in the gross domestic product, right? Except, you know, you spend money doing that sort of thing. But maybe the quality of life goes up if you don't have to spend hours driving or sitting in a car. Yeah. Good, great question. So it, it's a good question. I mean, they're, they're going to be car, the traditional car companies are in this business and they're going to do it. There also may be new car companies like Google may decide to make a car, or maybe they'll sell their software to someone else, right? Um, and there'll be other players. Maybe Apple will actually introduce a car, right? So it's hard. It's hard to say who's going to own this sort of thing. And it may be a combination. And the, the world will probably look quite a bit different. You know, Hertz and, and Avis and such probably won't be around much anymore. Okay. Um, the other question was um, behavioral data. Yeah. I mean, so. There's going to be all this data that's going to be available. So the, the great thing about the data, which I'll, I'll probably leave you with, is that you know when you learn to drive, you kind of learn to drive and you learn from your mistakes and that sort of thing. If you think about all these fleets of self-driving cars, they can all learn from each other. The, the amount of data they can collect and share is going to be enormous to get better at driving. So imagine you know, if a car, you know, if, it, if one Tesla makes a mistake or something, right, somewhere in a situation, that's going to be analyzed by the engineer, it's going to be broadcast, the other is going to be a software fix, and so then none of the Teslas will then make that same mistake, and this will be you know, generated more, more broadly. So yeah, there, there's an issue of, of data, um, and it's, 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 it's going to be a complicated world out there. It's hard to say what's actually going to happen with that. Yeah? Yeah, so this is sort of these lifeboat scenarios, and, and I don't get really excited about that because they all seem very artificial. Right? What they will do is they will do everything they can to probably avoid the accident, right? And I guess at some point there may have to be some software that will maybe make a, make a chain, a choice, right? And presumably they will make, you know, a choice to, you know, preserve human life over, you know, over the vehicle. Are they going to get into preserving the life of the occupants of the car over preserving the life of people outside? I don't know, and I, and I think it's kind of, a, these are really, you know, narrow kinds of corner cases. And I could be just naive about that, but I don't think it's going to be a big issue in the software that's going to hold up this thing dramatically. Do we have time for one more? What's that? Oh, yeah, I mean, the courts will have to deal all the, with all this sort of stuff, right? Okay. All right, um, thank you very much. Moshe, one more question. Of course. Sure. I mean, the way you're going to see this, is it's going to start with lanes, right? There'll be certain lanes which will only be for self-driving cars. And then it'll be entire roads, right? And it'll gradually come over. It's just like we have pedestrian malls, right? So, you know, we're not going to allow cars at all, maybe in the inner city, except, you know, maybe, maybe robot, you know, scooters or something, right? So, yes. It's going to happen, right? 
And, and, and this stuff is going to happen just, you know, the transition path is these cars are already doing this stuff and looking over your shoulder as you drive and taking over if you mess up. And that's going to be the transition, right, because it's going to be mandated that they have to do that. Okay, um, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to sit around if people have other questions. Here.